In the last session, we talked about how many calories you can eat each day and still lose about a pound a week. Once you know your daily total, you need to determine how to spread those calories among the meals and snacks you plan to eat. You also need to create standard meals that take the work out of staying within your allotment for each meal. Those are the subjects of this session. Your daily calorie allotment needs to be divided into meals and snacks that you plan to eat. Before you can do that, it's a very good idea to think about when you have the most control over what you eat. If you normally eat all of your meals at home and do your own cooking, then you have a great deal of control over what you eat. You just get the ingredients for your meal, measure and weigh them, prepare the meal and eat it. I actually found that during the COVID-19 pandemic, I had more control over what I was eating because I was eating nearly all of my meals at home. If someone else cooks for you, or if you have a job where you usually eat out, controlling what you eat requires more planning. If you frequently have dinner at a restaurant, then that meal may be more of a problem. If someone else cooks for you, then you're going to have to enlist their help. Of course, not every day is the same. Weekends are different from weekdays for many people, and sometimes you go out with friends, but probably not every day. But think about what some typical situations are for you, because that information is important when allocating your calories to meals. You also need to think about when you have the most control over what you eat. For me, I'm really good at breakfast and lunch, but evenings are much harder. If you're home during the day and may sometimes be bored, then that may be your biggest problem time. Whatever your situation, think hard about what times of the day you're most likely to be in good control of your eating and what times are likely to be harder. And it's fine to have more than one scenario. For example, a weekday plan and a weekend plan or a normal day plan and a plan when you go out with friends. But I'd advise allowing yourself more calories during the times that are usually harder for you. I allow myself four eating periods each day, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and an evening snack. I have an evening snack because I tend to stay up late and the longer the day goes on, the harder time I have. Also, think about the timing of your meals. I found that I was fine in the morning, but I was getting pretty hungry in the afternoon before dinner. By moving my lunch period back about an hour into the afternoon, things worked much better. You have to look at what flexibility your lifestyle allows for, but often there's a way to alter something if it's important to your success. I have a hard and fast rule that I rarely break. Don't eat between meals. Not at all. Nothing. Not it not even a cracker or a carrot or a beer. This is really important. Be a hard ass on this one. Not at all means not at all. Just remind yourself that the next meal isn't that far away and you have something really good planned to eat. Part of the reason I do that is that I tend to be an all or nothing person. Either I'm all in or I'm not in at all. You may be more flexible, but be careful. Eating between meals is one of the most likely ways to torpedo your plan, and it probably affects your insulin levels and other factors that alter your results. If you've allocated a certain number of calories to each meal and then eat those calories before the meal, you may very well be left without enough calories when mealtime rolls around. That's why for me, it's best not to eat between meals at all. Are there times when I violate that rule? Of course, but they are very frequent and I'm well aware of the danger they represent. And I plan for them and I count the calories I eat. I'm retired and live in a 55 plus community where my dinners are provided in a restaurant-like setting. However, I make my own breakfast and lunch. Since early in the day is my best period, I allocate fewer calories to breakfast and lunch and also a small number of calories for my evening snack. Even though it's a small snack, it's really important to me because if I want to eat after dinner, I can remind myself that it's not long until snack time. 
that's much easier to deal with than having to wait until the next morning. Allocating more calories to my evening meal leaves me more flexibility to deal with eating my dinners in the dining hall, where I have less control over what's available. I currently allow myself 1,800 calories a day, and I allocate them as follows. 400 calories for breakfast, 400 calories for lunch, 800 calories for dinner, and 200 calories for my evening snack. But keep in mind, that's just what works for me. You will probably have a different number for daily calorie allowance, and you may decide to allocate your calories to meals differently, depending on your problem times. Find a plan that works for you, not one that works for me. A really important part of cognitive weight control is the concept of standard meals. If limiting calories is what makes the program work, standard meals are what make it possible to live with. As I mentioned in an earlier session, if you're like me, you make lousy decisions in an eating situation. We mentioned that the solution of this problem is to try very hard to avoid making eating decisions in an eating situation. Standard meals are the most important tool for doing that. A standard meal is just one that you've planned and documented so that it essentially becomes a recipe. All you have to do is eat what's listed for the meal in the prescribed quantities and you will automatically stay within your calorie allotment for that meal without having to plan for it. You can have as many standard meals as you want. If you want, you can have dozens, hundreds. It's like eating in a restaurant that has only foods in quantities you're allowed. All you have to do is pick the meal you feel like having, make sure you have the ingredients on hand, measure things out, cook it if you need to, and eat it. The only decision you have to make is which standard meal do you want right now? I have my standard meals in a three ring binder with each page in a plastic protector. There are sections for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and evening snacks. I also have them in my food diary app, which we'll talk about in the next session. I nearly always eat one of my standard meals for breakfast, lunch, and evening snack. Because I eat my dinners in a restaurant-like setting, it's a little different. But fortunately, the menu is available before I go, so I can plan what I'm going to eat that fits within my calorie allotment. Since some entrees repeat from day to day, I don't have to do any calculations if it's a meal I've had before. It's just another standard meal. If you make lousy decisions when presented with an eating situation, then the best way to remove the decision from the eating situation is, is to have already made it. That's what standard meals do. And I really believe they are the single largest thing that's allowed me to be successful this time. Spend some time figuring out standard meals that you enjoy. Make them yours, get creative, but document them in a way that's easy to access when it comes time to eat. The top graphic here is an example of one of my standard meals. It's my oatmeal breakfast. Each line represents one of the items in the meal. The brand and item columns indicate what the item is. The density column is taken from the food label and shows how many calories the manufacturer says are in the indicated volume or weight. If it is a generic item, then this information comes from my food diary that we'll discuss in the next session. Sometimes this information may also come from an internet search or even from a calorie book. The volume and weight columns indicate how much of the item is included in the meal. I find that weight is usually a more accurate way to measure things than volume when both are available. And last, the calories column shows how many calories that item are in the meal based upon the quantity I plan to eat. The last line totals this column and should not be more than the number of calories allocated for the meal. Notice that the last line of the meal just says 45 calorie fruit serving. You may not want to do this until you get more experience, but since many fruits are seasonal, or I may not always have all of them on hand, this gives me the flexibility to have whatever fruit I choose without having to have a separate meal for each fruit. 
The second graphic shows how much of each fruit I can have for 45 calories. It also shows how much I can have for half that amount. On occasion, rather than having a whole serving of pineapple, for example, as one of my servings, I might have half a serving of pineapple and half a serving of strawberries. Like I said, you may not want to do this initially, but it gives you a lot of flexibility. I use the same concept for cold cereal and soup, but you really could use it for anything. So the breakfast meal for cereal, for example, just says one 150 calorie serving of cold cereal. And I can pick which cereal I feel like having and know how much to eat. Sometimes the number of calories you have available for an item in your standard meal is different from the number of calories in a serving shown on the nutrition label. Remember that algebra in school you were absolutely certain you would never use? Well, I'll put more information in the comments, but here's what you need to know. Suppose the nutrition label on your food says that it has 80 calories and 100 grams, but your meal only has room for 50 calories. How much can you eat? The label says 80 calories per 100 grams, so just flip that over so that it says 100 grams divided by 80 calories and multiply it by the number of calories you have available to get the number of grams you can eat. Conversely, you may have a recipe that requires 75 grams of an item, but the nutrition label still says 80 calories per 100 grams. How many calories of the item will be in your recipe? In this case, don't flip the density over. Just divide the calories by the grams and multiply by the number of grams your recipe calls for. This will give you the number of calories in your recipe. As I said, I'll put this information in the comments section below, so anytime you need it, you can just follow the formula. Standard meals are one of the most important concepts that allow you to stay on the cognitive weight control program for a long time without getting too frustrated with the planning. You can print out your standard meals and put them in a booklet or enter them into your food diary, as we'll discuss in the next session. I actually do both. Most of the time you should eat standard meals, but you can't always do that and frankly you won't always want to. So what do you do when that's not an option? There is a small number of situations where you'll have to wing it, but technology has made the situation today a whole lot easier than it used to be. For example, what should you do when you go to a restaurant? Many, I would even say most restaurants now have their menus online. Some even have nutritional counts online for their meals. Use this information before you go out to eat. Remember, you want to separate the point where you make the eating decision from the time when you consume the food. Because when the food is in front of you, well, we both know you don't do too well. So look at the menu and decide what you'll have before you go. Notice not only the main course, but the side dishes that come with it. If the restaurant doesn't provide nutritional information, estimate the portion sizes and decide what you will have before you go. If you know that you'll have a drink or dessert, include that in your calculation. It isn't that you can never have drinks or desserts, it's just that when you do have them, you need to plan for them and cut back in other areas to allow room for them in your calorie allocation. Then when you get to the restaurant, follow your plan. No one else even needs to know you decided what to eat before you got there. And don't get thrown off course when the unexpected happens. Maybe the waiter will announce an evening special that sounds wonderful. Maybe everyone else is having dessert or drinks when you didn't plan to. You can always have a club soda instead of a drink. You can always have coffee or tea or even hot water instead of dessert or sometimes have some fruit. It won't always be easy, but you can do it. Remember, your goal is to expand your life by reducing the fat you have to carry around with you, not to momentarily excite your taste buds with something you won't even remember in a few days. It's also possible to develop standard meals for restaurants you frequent. If when you go to a restaurant, you usually order one of a few items, then make that a standard meal and calculate its calories. It's another way to reduce the number of decisions you have to make 
and allow you to easily live on this program. Even when going to a friend's for dinner, you may be able to ask in advance what's on the menu. You can at least lay out the broad outlines for what you will eat and come close. It's good to remember that this is all about change. Later, we'll talk about power ideas, but I'm going to share one of my favorites with you right now. If you always do what you always did, you'll always get what you always got. This is all about change, and change is hard, but you can do it. So here's your limerick for this session. Duke ate like a pig and drank brew, but stayed slim till he turned 32. He lost five pounds of fat and told his obese friend that, I've solved this problem, can't you? Next time we'll talk about keeping track of what you eat. See you then.